good morning all this is the first lecture of a lecture series in classical mechanics and uh, there will be a total of 12 lectures in this series and this series is mainly intended for the undergraduate students so the general goal of classical mechanics is to determine what happens to a given set of objects in a given physical situation. In order to figure this out, we need to know what makes the objects move the way they do. There are two main ways of going about this task. The first one which you are all familiar with is to apply Newton's laws and that is known as Newtonian mechanics and the second one is applying Lagrange's equation and that is known as analytical mechanics. In this series, I will be mainly focusing on analytical mechanics. Before going into the analytical mechanics, I will give you a brief overview of Newtonian mechanics. It is all about a study of the dynamics of a macroscopic system from a knowledge of forces acting on it. System can be a single particle system or a system of particles. Here we will use Newton's equations and that is given by F is equal to dP by dt where P is the momentum of the system. If it is a single particle system and if it is a non-relativistic case, what is the meaning of non-relativistic case? That is the velocity of the particle is very much less than velocity of light. In that case, I can write Newton's equation as F is equal to d by dt of mv. mv is the momentum where v is the velocity. This m you can take it outside in the non-relativistic case. So, you can write it as m into dv by dt. This v is actually the derivative of position vector. So, I can write velocity as dr by dt. Therefore, I can write force as m into d square r by dt square. So, Newton's equation are second order ordinary differential equation in the variable time. It is a second order ordinary differential equation. Also, the important thing is that it is a vector. Force is a vector, position vector is a vector. So, in a three dimensional space, this can be split into three components. The position vector can be written as r is equal to x i cap plus y j cap plus z k cap. Force f can be written as f x i cap plus f y j cap plus f z k cap. So, I can write this vector equation as three component equations. The first one is m into d square x by dt square is equal to f x. m into d square y by dt square is equal to f y. m into d square z by dt square is equal to f z. All these are again second order ordinary differential equations. So, since the original equation is a vector equation in three dimensional space, it will have three component equations. We can write it like this. Solving this equation, we can find x as a function of t, y as a function of t and z as a function of t. Okay? That is the meaning of solving the system of equations. Now, we will consider an example, a particle falling freely under gravity. This is the question, a particle falling freely under gravity. Suppose this particle is falling freely from a height, say h. Suppose it is falling freely, that is its initial velocity is zero. It is just dropping. Okay? Since it is moving under the action of gravity, the force acting on the system is F is equal to minus mg into z cap. Why it is minus z cap, the direction? Because I considered the upward direction as z axis. So, the gravity is acting in the vertically downward direction. So, you can denote it along minus z cap. So, F is minus mg z cap. I can write Fx, the x component of force as 0. Fy, the y component of force as 0 and Fz, z component of force is minus mg. So, 
among these three equations, the first two equations will give you right hand side 0. The third equation will give you m into d square z by dt square is equal to minus mg. m and m will cancel. So, d square z by dt square is equal to minus g. Solving this equation, you need to know how to solve differential equation. So, do one integration. One integration will give you the left hand side as first derivative dz by dt. The right hand side will be minus g. The derivative is minus gt plus some integration constant c1. Integrating once more, the left hand side becomes z of t. Right hand side minus g is a constant. Integration of t will be t square by 2 plus c1 into integral will be t plus integration constant c2. So, one more integration will give you z as a function of t and it is given by minus half g t square plus c1 t plus c2. Here you can notice that there are two constants. One is c1 that is the result of first integration. Second one is c2 that is the result of second integration. So, whenever you have a second order differential equation, the final solution will contain two integration constants, two integration constants. In order to get a unique solution for z, you have to find the value of c1 and c2. For that, you need different conditions. Here we will say they are initial conditions. The initial conditions of this problem is, it is initially at a height h. It is initially at a height h. That is, initially the z-coordinate of this particle is h. And it is dropping. That means, at t equal to 0, its velocity is 0. So, these are the two conditions. The initial position and initial velocity are given. So, we can use that conditions in order to find the, in order to find the constants. So, I will give, this is the condition, v of 0, velocity at time t equal to 0 is 0, z of 0 is equal to h, position at time t equal to 0 is h. You can substitute in this expression, dz by dt is actually velocity, you can substitute here as 0 when t is equal to 0. So, that will give me c1 as 0. And for this z value, you can substitute it as h when t is equal to 0. So, this is 0, this is 0. So, c2 you will get it as h. So, value of c2 is h, c1 is 0 for this particular set of initial conditions. So, once you have the initial conditions, you will get a unique solution for z. And it is z of t is equal to h minus half g t square. The derivative of this z will give you velocity and that is nothing but minus g t. So, this is the complete solution of the problem. You know that the particle is at a height h at time t equal to 0 and the only force acting on this particle is gravity. So, you have information about force acting on the particle. You have information about the initial state of the particle. Your aim is to find the state of particle at a later time t. Now, you got two equations. One will give you the velocity at an instant of time t. Second one will give you the position at an instant of time t. So, that makes the complete solution of the system. This is the procedure of Newtonian mechanics. And I will give you the plot of this z and the plot of z of t and v of t as a function of time. So, along the horizontal axis you have time, along the vertical axis it is z. So, as time increases, the value of z decreases from h. So, as time increases, this body is coming down. So, its position coordinate, the value of z decreases with the time. Okay, That is the meaning of this uh, graph. Now, coming to the velocity, it is minus gt. That is the meaning of negative sign. It is moving downward. That is the meaning of negative sign. Because we are taking upward direction as positive z-axis. So, a downward motion or downward velocity, you have to put it as negative sign. So, velocity is linearly increasing with the time. Linearly increasing with the time. And you can see that the velocity starts from 0. It is linearly increasing with the time. But its value is negative. That simply means that it is moving downward. So, this is the procedure of Newtonian mechanics. 
okay i hope it is clear to you and uh, when the system has some restrictions newton's equations has some limitations okay this is actually a free particle which is moving under gravity there is no restriction for this particle but if you are claiming that if this particle is restricted to move along a particular trajectory then the situation will be different the three newton's equations in this case m into d square x by dt square equal to fx m into d square y by dt square equal to fy m into d square z by dt square equal to fz all these three are independent of each other because x y z are not related in any way so these three are independent equations you can solve them independently but if there is some constraint that is some relation between x y and z that means these equations are not independent okay these equations are no longer independent of each other and you cannot solve it separately okay you have to find out the relation between x y and z and you have to eliminate one of the variable and then solve the independent equations okay so that is will be the procedure when there are some constraints also when there are constraints there will be associated constraint forces and in newton's equation the left hand side of this equation f contains all the forces acting on the system and it is sometimes difficult to find the constraint forces and substituting in here so when there are constraints using newton's law will be difficult then we need an alternate formulation so these are the basic conditions under which we are going towards a new formulation when there are constraints or there are some restrictions in the system newton's equations are no longer independent then we have to identify the constraints and we have to make independent equations and there is an alternate formulation altogether and it is known as analytical mechanics and before again i will discuss what is the meaning of restrictions and what are meaning of constraints then we will discuss the formulation of analytical mechanics so first we will discuss what is the meaning of constraints or restrictions what is constraint they are restrictions imposed to a system they are restrictions imposed to a system that is known as constraints so i will give you a few examples first one is a particle dropped to a floor from from a height h this is the restriction drop the to a floor drop the to a floor so what makes or which what should be the equation that representing this restriction drop the to a floor if you are taking the floor as origin and upward direction as positive say this is z axis upward direction is positive z axis then when this particle is dropped from a height h after some time it will hit the floor and it will rebound from there it cannot go beyond this z equal to 0 point or z should be always greater than or equal to 0 so that is a constraint z should be always greater than or equal to 0 in the earlier case there were no restriction like that here the sentence is a particle dropped to a floor from a height edge so there is a floor the particle cannot go beyond that floor particle will rebound from the floor so the z coordinate of the particle at any instant of time should be greater than or equal to zero this is a constraint this is a constraint relation okay now consider another example gas molecules inside a container suppose you have a cubical container a cube of side length a and uh, one corner at origin along the x direction it has a length a along the y direction it has a length a along the z direction it has a length a and there are gas molecules inside this container suppose xi yi zi with the position coordinates of a particular gas molecule and the gas molecules can move only inside this cubical box means xi yi zi all of them can take value between 0 and a between 0 and a particle cannot go beyond this box that means 
its position coordinate should be restricted between 0 and a. And this i, if there are n particles, this i can vary from 1 to n. For the first particle, you can write it as x1, y1, z1 should lie between 0 and a. For the second particle, x2, y2, z2 should lie between 0 and a. So, these are known as constraints. They are constrained relations. So, this is a, also an example of constrained system. Consider the third case, a bead moving through a rod. Suppose you have a rod in the xy plane, a rod inclined at an angle alpha with the x-axis. Suppose you have a bead which is restricted to move only along this rod, only along this rod. And the position at any instant of time can be specified by two numbers x and y. Since the bead is constrained to move along the rod only, we can say that this x and y are not independent. They are not independent. If this angle is alpha, we can say that tan alpha is y by x. Tan alpha is y by x. Or y is equal to x tan alpha. Or you can say that y minus x tan alpha is equal to 0 always. Irrespective of the position of this particle, irrespective of the position of this particle, y coordinate is always x tan alpha. Or y minus x tan alpha is always 0. This is a constraint. This is a constraint. Now, consider another example. Simple pendulum or a planar pendulum. That is a bob, a bob attached to a string of length L. The other end of the string is fixed at say O. This is taken as the origin of a coordinate system. And you have x axis and y axis. So, the position coordinate of this bob can be denoted as x and y, where x is this horizontal length from origin and y is this vertical length from origin. Here, of course, the y coordinate is negative, but the position of the bob at any instant of time can be specified by two numbers. But if I insist that the length of the string is a constant, say L, then I can say that x square plus y square is always L square. Whatever be the position of this bob, x square plus y square is always L square. That is, you can write x square plus y square minus L square is equal to 0. So, this is a constraint to the motion of this bob. This is a constrained motion. Again, consider another example, a dumbbell moving in a two-dimensional plane. So, you have an xy plane, you have a dumbbell, two masses connected by a rigid rod. That is known as a dumbbell. So, you have a two masses M1 and M2 connected by a rigid rod of length L. Suppose the first mass has coordinates x1, y1, second mass has coordinates x2, y2. Then, the length of the rod is remain fixed irrespective of the motion of the dumbbell. That means, the distance between two points, we have this equation x2 minus x1 square plus y2 minus y1 square and that should be equal to L square. So, we can write it as x2 minus x1 square plus y2 minus y1 square minus L square equal to 0. So, this is again a constraint. So, this is a relation connecting position coordinates. So, the position coordinates are not independent of each other. They are connected by this equation. So, this is a constrained motion. Consider another example. Example 6. A bead moving on a moving rod. Now, in this example, the bead is moving on a rod, but that rod itself is moving towards right with a velocity v. That rod itself is moving towards right with a velocity v. At t equal to 0, the rod was somewhere here. And after in a time t, it moves to the right a distance vt, where v is the velocity of the rod. And it is at this position now. And bead is moving along this rod. The position of bead at any instant of time can be represented as x comma y and let this angle alpha, this alpha is a constant, okay. This rod is moving parallel to x axis, alpha is fixed. So, tan alpha I can write again as y by this distance. What is this distance? Depending on this origin, this coordinate has an x, code, x value x. That is, x is the distance from origin to this point. Vt is this distance. So, from here to here, distance is x minus Vt. This vertical height is y. 
So tan alpha is y by x minus vt or y is equal to x minus vt tan alpha. We can write it as y minus x minus vt tan alpha equal to 0. So this is again a constraint. This is again a constraint. Okay. Now I will summarize. Constraints are restrictions imposed to a system. We can classify the constraints into two. One is holonomic constraints. That is constraints which can be expressed as which can be expressed as equations. Expressed as equations. Constraints which can be expressed as equations connecting the position coordinates. So there will be some equation f of r1, r2, etc. rn is equal to 0, where r1, r2, etc. rn are position coordinates of the various particles of the system. So there will be a relation connecting the position coordinates of the particles of the system. Okay, there will be an equation. Such constraints are called the holonomic constraints. And in the four, in the six examples we considered, this is a relation connecting position coordinates, not a relation, it is exactly an equation. So this is a holonomic constraint. This is an equation connecting position coordinates. It is a holonomic constraint. This is an equation connecting position coordinates. So it is a holonomic constraint. This is an equation connecting position coordinates. So it is a holonomic constraint. This is not an equation. This is a relation. Okay. This is not an equality. This is a condition less than or equal to. So this is not a holonomic constraint. This is a condition. Z is always greater than or equal to zero. So this is not a holonomic constraint. So we can say that example 3, 4, 5, 6 are holonomic constraints. All constraints which are not holonomic are known as non-holonomic constraints. Okay. That is there is not an equation. It will be just some condition. Not an equation but just some conditions. Examples are again 1 and 2. Z is greater than or equal to 0. It is a condition. This is a non-holonomic constraint. Gas molecules inside a container. This is a condition. So, this is a non-holonomic constraint. Okay. Now, again, this holonomic constraint we can divide into two. One is scleronomic and the other one is rheonomic. What is scleronomic? Time independent constraints are known as scleronomic. Time dependent constraint is called rheonomic. Your example 6, this constraint equation has explicit dependence on time, explicit dependence on time. So, it is a rheonomic constraint. But this has no time dependence. This constraint has no time dependence. This constraint has no time dependence. This constraint has no time dependence. These are all scleronomic. So, whenever you have a time independent constraint, it is called scleronomic. Time dependent constraints are called rheonomic. So, this is the meaning of constraints. So, this is just a basic definition and whenever you have constraint, there is a relation connecting position coordinates and the Newton's equations in various coordinates are no longer independent of each other, no longer independent of each other. So, it is not easy to solve Newton's equations and we will look forward to new formulations when there are systems containing constraints, when there are systems containing constraints. So, the details we will discuss in the next class.